Uh, I am going to jump right on in because, you know, it's about that time. I want to get into the Word of God today. And I'm starting a brand new series, especially as we enter in the Easter season. I call this, It Happened in the Garden. It Happened in the Garden. And I've got a little subtitle for you today, which you're probably not going to like. You might throw your Bibles at me, but that's okay. It's called, Are You Ready for the Test? So, yeah, they, I can already feel you. I mean, I've ne- I'm not even talking about the test. And you're already bemoaning the fact that the word test is involved in the message. So uh, how many of you know testing is involved daily in your life, never mind in a message? So what I want to do is I kind of today I just want to kind of lay the foundation and kind of get you ready for the next couple of weeks as we work through this process. And I'm going to use as an example Jesus being in the garden and we're going to work our way through this. But where I want to start, I want you to go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And uh, um, uh, for the risk of losing some of your attention, I'm going to read a lot of Scripture, but it's because I really believe that you need to see the context of what we are communicating today. Uh, Let me just ask you a question. How many of you like tests? (laughs) You you just told me how many of you like tests, right? It's kind of like, well, that's a stupid question. Why are you so dumb? I mean, nobody likes tests, but how many of you know tests are necessary? And why are tests necessary? Because tests help us to evaluate where we're at. It kind of really reveals where we are. Now, when God tests you, you must understand God's not testing for information. He, he never tests for information because He has all the information He needs. And as a matter of fact, God doesn't want you just to have the right answers. He wants you to live the right answer. So just having the right answer actually makes you religious, but it doesn't make you relational. Uh, you might know every right word, you might know every biblical answer, but knowing the right answer doesn't mean get you in. Uh, it doesn't even mean that you've passed the test. It is working through the process of understanding why the test is there, why God does that, and then it leads you to that next level of growth in your experience with Christ. Here's what I want you to understand. You can never, and I want to, I want to use that word never because I know we say, you know, never use never. Well, you, yes, let, let me say it to you like this. You can never grow in Christ when you are disengaged. There is, there is no such thing as a disengaged Christ follower that actually grows. Now, you can disengage from a lot of things, and uh, sometimes it's good to disengage from some things. Sometimes you go to work, and, you know, once, you, once you're home, you kind of disengage from all the busyness that you had at work, uh, you know, and, and that's good, and that's healthy because you need a Sabbath, and you need a rest, and all those things are necessary. But when it comes to your spiritual maturity and your spiritual growth, and when it comes to you bearing the fruit that's necessary for your spiritual life to show the evidence of Christ being in you like we have learned over the last several weeks, then there's a necessity that you understand you must stay fully engaged in the spiritual process that God has you in. Meaning that you do not ever disengage in your relationship with Christ. There's no such thing as taking unsaved leave. Are you with me? There's no such thing. Well, I'm just going to take a vacation from you, Jesus, for a week, and then we'll get back together. It doesn't work like that. To disengage means you do not understand, number one, how vital it is, not only for now, but for eternity and for the rewards that God has for you and for the purpose that God has for your life. You cannot disengage your spiritual journey. So because of that, God is saying there are things that will cause you to disengage. So therefore, you must watch out for these things. You must eliminate them ruthlessly out of your life. And you must make sure that they don't hinder you as you are trying to make the progress that you know is necessary for the evidence that you say that you believe. Because I'm saying I believe, therefore there has to be an evidence of my belief. Because my belief is not something that just I form with my mouth. It actually is something that transforms my life. My belief that I have in Christ is not a belief system that I adhere to like I can believe in anything else. No, maybe like in a Toyota, I believe Toyota is a good car. And that's a belief system. I believe I can sit on that chair and it will hold me up. That's a belief system. But it's beyond that. It actually shapes and forms and not only forms my life, but it transforms my life into that which I need to be. And that is a mature follower of Christ. The theme of our year has been fruitfulness, and we are learning how to become fruitful in the places that God has put us. So now, having said that, 
This is not part of the message that was for free, no payment involved. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and I want to pick up from the beginning. Are you tracking with me, church? All right, so it'll be on the overhead. You can follow along in your app, your Bible apps, or if you have your Bible for the real spiritual people that are here, then open that Bible, and then let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Some of you don't like that. For the real spiritual people, open up your Bibles, okay? Watch this. I don't want you to forget. Somebody say, I don't need to forget. Okay, what is it, dear brothers and sisters, about, here's what you should not forget, about our ancestors in the wilderness long ago. All of them, somebody say all of them, were guided by a cloud that moved ahead of them. And all of them, say all of them, walked through the sea on dry ground in the cloud and in the sea. All of them, say all of them, were baptized as followers of Moses. All of them, say all of them, ate the same spiritual food. Are you getting a theme here? Are you with me? Okay, and all of them, say all of them, drank the same spiritual water. For they drank from the spiritual rock that traveled with them, and that rock was Christ. Yet, somebody say yet. Yet. So we know all of them, yet God was not pleased with most of them. And their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now I want you to note verse 6. These things, somebody say these things. Watch this. Happened as a what? Warning to whom? To us. Why? So that we would not crave evil things as they did, or worship idols as some of them did. As the scriptures say, the people celebrated with feasting and drinking, and they indulge in pagan revelry, and we must not engage in sexual immorality as some of them did, causing 23,000 of them to die in one day. Nor should we put Christ to the test, as some of them did, and then died from snake bites. And don't grumble as some of them did, and then were destroyed by the angel of death. Now, how many of you know that's not a great picture, is it? But I want want you to see a few things real quick before I read the next uh, uh, level of verses. They had the same experience, that's what verse 1 tells us. They had the same opportunities, that's what verse 2 tells us. And they had the same provision, that's what verse 3 and verse 4 tells us. The same experience, the same opportunities. The same provision. How do I know it? Because Paul wants us to understand that. That's why he repeats a phrase. All of them. All of them. All of them. All of them. So that means there was not one of them that didn't have an experience. The experience of having the pillar of fire, the pillar of cloud. There's not one of them that didn't walk through the Red Sea. There's not one of them that did not experience the manna that God had provided. There was not one of them that experienced God's power that delivered them again and again. There was not one of them that were not provided for. They were all provided. As a matter of fact, where did they get their water? It was Christ Jesus who was the rock that followed them. And water came out of that rock to take care of them. So the provision was the same. The experience was the same. The opportunities was the same. And the provision was the same. But here's the problem. The outcome was not. Now, why is it that some people can have the same experience, the same opportunities, the same provision, yet the outcome is different? I I think that's something we ought to think about. And he tells us the reason we ought to think about it is because some of them fell fell for different traps. He says they craved evil things. He says they worshipped idols. They pursued only pleasure. They engaged in sexual immorality. Some of them tested the Lord. And and I love that this is part, the next thing that I'm going to mention to you, you would think it's not on the same level as the other stuff, idolatry, sexual immorality, testing the Lord. But he says grumbled. Somebody say grumbling. So they were grumbling and complaining. How many of you know God puts grumbling and complaining on the same level as sexual immorality? He puts grumbling and complaining at the same level as testing the Lord. Hola. Now, now, now why, why is that? Because when you grumble, here's what you're grumbling against. You're not grumbling against your circumstance. You're grumbling against the God who placed you in that circumstance which you are actually doubting the very character of God. You are doubting the very person of God. So you are actually doing all the things that you're not supposed to be doing because you don't recognize and realize that what you're going through is actually a test to get you to where God has for you. He said, well, where do you get that, preacher boy? Well, let's continue reading. Are you still with me? We ain't done yet, so don't sit down or shut down. Watch this. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11. Are you there? Now watch. I love what he says. These things what? Happen to whom? Them as what? 
How beautiful that they can become our example. That we can look at what they did and we can see an example either one or two things. An example not to follow or an example to follow. Then he goes on. They were written down to what? Work with me, church. I think it's on the screen. They were written down. Why why were they written down? To warn us who what? Where? Would you agree we live at the end of the age? Now, even if you don't think we're living at the end of the age, we're living at the end of your age. Right? I don't care what, you know, electric lung or chamber they freezing you, you know, Cairo freezing or whatever, Cairo, whatever the freezing that is to freeze your body and in 200 years to wake you up, you'll be dead. <laughs> D-E-D, dead. Are you with me? I don't care how many tucks you get, boat tucks, butt tucks, side tucks, uh, you know, tucks, and yeah, you might know what I'm talking about. I don't care what fat they use, butt fat, side fat, any kind of fat to blow you up. It doesn't matter. You're going to get old. And the reality of getting older, and I'm, I'm seeing it more now that I'm 32, the, the, I, I just have a lot of mileage, but I really am that young. But the reality is this, is that as you grow older, that you begin to recognize that one thing happens to you, no matter how healthy you try to live, your body is breaking down. Your body, your body just refuses to say, I'm sorry, I ain't doing that. You say, well, you need to. You say, I won't. And then you say, well, I'll show you. And then you're in bed and traction for a week. (laughs) Anybody know what I'm talking about? Only the old people are raising. They can't even raise their hands. They look, they just ask somebody to, can you please raise my hand for me? I I can't even raise it. (laughs) But then he goes on. He warns us to live at the end of the age. If you think, somebody say, if I think you are standing strong, be careful not to fall. So he, it's, this is a warning. He says, hey, don't, don't put yourself above these folks. Don't think you are better than them. He says, be very careful. And then he goes on. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. So that means whatever temptation you are going through, it is no different than what other people have gone through or are going through. And then he adds, and God is what? faithful, he will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so you can what? Now, I need you to hear me now. He is not talking about some test. He is not saying that there are not some things in our lives that are going to overwhelm us. Because we quote this verse always out of context. Because when we go through something, we try to be nice to somebody. Say, oh, don't worry. You know, the Lord will not allow you to go through what you cannot handle. That's not true. There's a lot of things I go through that I absolutely cannot handle. I cannot handle it. I don't want to do it. I don't want to handle it. It's difficult to handle. It's sorrowful. It's it's absolutely disgusting. I don't want to face it. And I cannot make it on my own. But I know what I do is that I rely on Him because I cannot handle it. He is not talking about testing here. He is not talking about things happening in your life that you cannot absolutely uh, do not have a difficulty to go through. He is talking about temptation. This is the context. The context is not testing. The context is temptation. And he says the temptation to do these things that they did will come to all of us. So the temptation is the same. But he says, hey, I want you to know the power to overcome the temptation is the same as well. The reason you don't overcome temptation is not because God has abandoned you or not given you the power to overcome. It's because you are not leaning into what God gave you. Why? Because God is faithful so that the temptation that I'm facing is not greater than the temptation that you are facing. It might be different in some way because I might be tempted in some arenas that you are not tempted in. But he says, nevertheless, regardless of that, there is someone somewhere that are facing the same temptation that I'm facing. And if there's someone there that has faced the same temptation, yet they have been able to overcome it. So what is Paul saying? If one can lean into God and overcome it, then all can lean into God and overcome it. 
There is no reason why you have to give in to what the enemy dishes up. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can what? Now, here's what I want you to think about. Jesus was very deliberate in the things that he exposed the disciples to. He was preparing them for life and for ministry after he was gone. He was introducing kingdom living and getting them ready for that which was to come. He was making and forming them into the people that would give birth to his church. A church that would face absolute extreme challenges and Christ follows both men and women that would eventually pay the ultimate price uh, uh, with their lives. They would literally lay down their lives for the cause of Christ. And in John 15, we find the lesson of the vine, and we kind of started that with our last series, but I don't want to go back there. And we have Jesus telling them that he's about to go away. He also tells them that they are going to be persecuted, and they are going to be killed. Why? Because of him. He says in John 16 that their sorrow will be changed into joy. So he's not saying, hey, this is all going to be awesome You're going to be happy. You get, everybody, it's like, it's like Jesus, Oprah, handing out happiness everywhere. You get happiness. You get ha- You, you. Everybody gets happiness. He says, no, you got to understand there's going to be some tough days ahead of you. There's going to be some hard days ahead of you. There's going to be some sorrowful days ahead of you. Why does Jesus give us the reality? So that we are prepared when we get there and not surprised. Look at John 16, 29. His disciples said, finally, and I love this. You're giving it to us straight in plain talk. No more figures of speech. Now we know that you know everything. It all comes together in you. Now, those are great words, aren't they? And then they, they, they go on. They, how many of you know sometimes people suffer from verbal diarrhea? They should stop, but they don't. They just kind of reveal themselves, all right? He's, now we know that you know everything. It all comes together in you. You won't have to put up with our questions anymore. We are convinced that you came from God. Look at verse 31. Jesus answered them, do you finally believe? In fact, what's going to happen? You're about to make a run for it. You're saying, oh, we're with you, Jesus. Here's the way you're going to make a run. You're going to try to save your own skins, and you're going to abandon me. But I'm not abandoned. The Father is with me. I've told you all this. I've told you all this, all this tough stuff, all this abiding stuff, so that trusting me, you'll be unshakable and assured, deeply at peace. In this godless world, you'll continue to experience difficulties, but take heart, I've conquered the world. They say, we believe. We have no more questions. Jesus says, you're going to run like a bunch of scary cats. Now hang with me because I want to show you the progression here. I want you to notice John 17, 1. This is now right after Jesus told them this. The first part of the verse says this. After Jesus had finished speaking to his disciples, he looked up toward heaven and prayed. So I want you to paint the picture. Let's paint this picture here. He's telling them what's going to happen. He tells them to abide. He's sharing with them. He prays for them. And then here in in John 16, he tells them, hey, boys, I want you to know you're going to run for your lives. You're going to abandon me. There's not a single one of you that's going to be left. They're like, no, 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 we get it. How many of you ever had people tell you they get it and you know they're not getting it? Now, anybody have teenagers? Come on, raise your hand. How many of you know how many times you have to explain something to them again and again and again and again? But I I get it, Dad. No, you don't, you dummy. You just don't. You don't get it yet. The light is not on yet. I'm sorry I called you a child a dummy. But, I mean, they are at the moment. But then Jesus wants, he wants them to understand. And then suddenly in this progression, what does Jesus do? He suddenly, as he's finished speaking to them, he looks up towards heaven and he prays. I want you to catch this. Jesus taught them about the importance of abiding in him, but he also warned them what was about to take place. He then demonstrates to them how to abide. Why do I say this? Because right as he finishes his sentence, he looks towards heaven and he starts praying to the Father. Jesus is showing the disciples that abiding is being aware of God's presence at any moment, at any time. 
And if you will do this, it will enable you to bear up under the difficult circumstances as well as the temptation that might be coming your way. You see, abiding in the presence of God enables us to bear up under the difficult circumstance to, so that we can overcome the testing and the temptation. The reality is all of us will be tempted and all of us will be tested, but not all of us overcome. Why? Because we try to face it on our own instead of facing it with Him. You see, Jesus demonstrated and then He taught them an illustrated sermon, if you will. They, on the other hand, say, wait, 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 we get it, and we get it so good, Jesus, that you don't even have to worry. We will never ask you another question. How many of you know that's kind of dumb, isn't it? Hey, we believe, however, Jesus is about to expose them. Now, I need you to understand this. God does not expose to wound and to shame. He exposes to reveal and to heal. He does not reveal for his benefit because he doesn't need any revelation. He knows what's going on. On the other hand, the disciples needed a revelation of themselves, which they believed the wrong thing about themselves. That's why Paul writes, he says, if you think you are strong, be careful that you don't fall. And they are showing us that they were full of bravado, even in the presence of Jesus, that they say, no, 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 we will withstand, but they fell. You see, we need revelation so that we are prepared for what we might face. I'm, I'm going to be very blunt with you. There are things that you are going to face in your life that is not going to want you to sing hallelujah. Hallelujah. Things that you're going to go through in your life, it's going to tear you apart. It's going to hurt you so bad and the pain is going to be so real that you will be tempted in some ways not only to question your own faith, but to question the God of your faith. You see, and God knows that this is the potential. Why does He know this, this is a potential? Because He knows we are living in a world that has fallen. This, is not, this world, the way it is, we can see there are glimpses of goodness, but how many of you know there's a lot of bad stuff in this world? There are glimpses of beauty. There are glimpses of, of, of excellence. There are glimpses of glory. And, 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 and we are drawn to that. And that's good because we should be drawn to the positive. But when you cut the veneer out, there's a lot of pain in this world. There's a lot of hurt in this world. There's a lot of sorrow in this world. There's a lot of difficulty in this world. And Jesus wants you to know that he's very much aware of the world in which we live. And he wants you to know because he's aware of it, he is going to face it. But he's not only going to face it, he's going to overcome it. And so he wants you to have a revelation. Why? So that when those things come into your life, your faith is not shaken. You are now even more grounded. It means that you don't get pulled up. You get rooted down. Which means when the storm comes, you don't question. You don't look up and say, why? You look down and you say, deeper. You say, now this, it's pounding you, yes. And yes, it's pounding me. But here's how it's pounding me. It's pounding me deeper into Christ. Deeper into the reality of God. Deeper into God's goodness. Why? Because I know this. The only way that this will make sense, if there is a just God who in the end will make everything okay. We get it, Jesus. Uh, you don't. We believe, Jesus, really, it's taken you three and a half years of discipleship, and now you believe? So I'm going to have to reveal to you where you're at. So I'm going to have to take you through a process so you can see where you are. But here's what I want you to know, that I've already prayed for you. Peter, Peter, pumpkin eater. You're going, to, you're going to mess up big, but I want you to know I already prayed for you, and I've already seen you being restored. Because the preparation always comes before the test. 
Jesus told them how to overcome by doing what he does, and that's to abide. There is something, uh, hear me now, I'm not even going to look at you, I'm going to look to those online uh, because you need it. Uh, But there is something about the human heart, uh, just come on, admit it with me, that struggles with vulnerability. We hate to admit that we don't know something. We do not like to admit that we are wrong. We would rather protest and argue and put up a defense even though we know we are lying to ourselves. And we would rather give an excuse and put up a fight before that we admit that we were wrong and we are not as smart as we think we are. We do this all the time and we do this even in our relationships. But what really reveals this, what I would term this low grade of arrogance, is we even think we can argue with God. Now that's gone to a whole nother level. As Jesus and the disciples are leaving the upper room because he's taking them now, he starts talking to them about what's going to take place. I I, I love that God prepares us. And during this conversation, Peter is adamant about his commitment to Christ. I mean, he is so clear. He says that he's fully ready. Jesus, are you ready? Yes, I am. Jesus tells him, Peter, I want you to know you're going to deny me. Peter insists that he's ready. He even goes as far to make this proclamation. He says, even if everybody else abandons you, guess what? I got you, JC. Look with me in Mark 14. Are you still there? Look at Mark 14, 26. Then they sang a hymn. This is now after. And went out to where? The Mount of Olives. On the way. Somebody say on the way. How many of you know Jesus ain't done yet? He's messing with them. He knows these guys need help. Sometimes God communicates consistently. The problem is we've already made up our mind about what we think God is going to say. We've already assumed what God is going to say about something before we've ever heard what he actually says about us. Jesus told them, look at this. Look at these words. Are are you there, church? All of you. Somebody say all of you. Look at this. Will not eat dessert. You will desert me. Why? For the scriptures say God will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Look at verse 28. I love this. But after I'm raised from the dead, I will go ahead of you to Galilee and meet you there. Now look at verse 29. Peter is not listening. Why? Because he's not, he's, not he's not even responding to the words that Jesus is saying. Yeah. How do I know this? Look at this. Peter said, to him, even if everyone else deserts you, I never will. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, Peter. This very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny three times that you even knew me. Hello. Look at Peter's words. Look at verse 31. What is the next word? No. no. Peter Declare them fat. So he's yelling. No. I ain't doing that, JC. There's no way. And now he's going to add a little bit of chutzpah right there. Look at this. Even if I have to die, I will never deny you. But don't stop. Look at the rest of the verse. You see, we are so quick to jump on Peter. (laughs) Let me remind you, Jesus told them, all of you are going to deny me. And then all of them said, we won't do it. You see, Peter is not the only one making bold statements. Both Matthew and Mark record that it was not just Peter, but all of the disciples that were emphatic that they were ready to die for Jesus. Now, what does Jesus do? He takes them to a familiar place. They're used to coming here. They spend time in the garden. They slept in the garden. And unlike the upper room where they had supper, Jesus takes them to a very familiar place. He knows that Judas has already set in motion his betrayal. And he knows, Judas knows where they would be spending the night. And at the foot of Mount of Olives stands the Garden of Gethsemane, filled with olive trees. The Garden of Gethsemane is where Jesus spent his last hours praying to his Father, just before the Roman soldiers arrested him. Jesus is about to be pressed, and within a few moments, he will face unimaginable testing. But he is fully prepared, and he is completely ready. 
That's why he came. And at no moment will he be backing down. Jesus was not looking for a way out. Jesus knows what is about to take place. He also knows that his disciples are not ready as they think they are. Even though they have confessed their undying loyalty to the point of death, they're about to fail the test. All due to their false bravado, there is a place in your spiritual journey toward maturity that you will face testing. And God does not promote those who think they can pass the test. He only promotes those who pass the test. Testing always precedes godly promotion. Don't miss this. If Jesus was tested and faced temptation, don't you think you will face temptation? The question is not, will I face testing and temptation? The question is this, am I fully prepared? Even right now in the world that we are living in, the churches, we quick to, and when it's good, we sing songs, hallelujah, when we have jobs and we have provision, and it's all good. But guess what? It's not in the good that we show we have faith. It is in the absolute crucible of life that we reveal what we really believe. And church, you got to hear this preacher. I know everybody's saying we're going to be raptured out, and if we are, kumbaya, wonderful. But we might have to go through some stuff. And it's one thing for you to say you are ready, but you just might not be. And it is my job as your pastor to love you enough to tell you the truth and to get you ready for what you might face. Because if I don't and we only live in happy la-la land you, and you cannot face the reality, you will blame me because you'll say, well, you said, no, I did not say what you think I said. I said you're going to have to grow. I said you're going to have to get rooted down. I said you're going to have to know the word. I said you're going to have to rely on the Holy Spirit. Because the days ahead might not be as easy as the day behind. And if we are not fully prepared, some of you will abandon your faith and will give up. Because you think that God has abandoned you. Because you've only heard that God is only in the good. But what you don't know that God is in the good, the bad, the ugly, and the in-between. And that this day of restoration must come to this place that God has put us. That's why he told us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. Where? On earth. God doesn't want to blow up what he created. He wants to restore it. So he puts the church in the middle of the sea of turmoil so that we can be a little bit of a reflection of what it is to have a little bit of heaven on earth so that when people look at us, they know us by what? By our love for one another. When they look in the sea of turmoil and they're looking for hope, where do they find it? They see how we treat one another, how we honor one another, how we serve one another, how we love one another. And they see what life truly needs to be. There are times in our lives that God's will for us will not be easy to understand and as a matter of fact, not easy to embrace. But there's a way to get to the other side. There are seasons when the enemy of your faith, hear me now, church, will release assignments against you. See, you know, here's what we've done. We've stopped talking about the devil and stopped talking about hell because it's too negative. Well, hell's real, the devil's real. And we ought to be fully prepared. And we ought to not fear any hell or the devil. Because we ain't facing him in our own strength. But we know he's masquerading and walking around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. But we must be fully prepared. So, can I just dig a few more minutes? Are you still okay with this? (laughs) That's what you say now. I want you to understand this principle. Are you ready? Understand this, arrogance produces ignorance, but humility releases grace. Arrogance produces ignorance, but humility releases grace. Look at James 4, and again, context is important. Listen to the words that James, I love James, 
Some people don't like him. I really like him. Look, look at James 4, 4. He just comes right out with it. Look at the first two words. Are you ready? Let's read this uplifting verse together. Are you ready for this? One, two, three. Ooh. You what? Don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again. I say it again. If you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself... Now, he is not talking about being friends with someone who doesn't know the Lord. He's talking about a system that is against, the world system that is against, and it's a system of idolatry. And he is saying when you, are, when you engage in that system of idolatry, you become an adulterer. It's exactly the thing that Paul warned us about in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that we read in the beginning. Anybody know what I'm talking about? So you have to understand that the adultery that he's talking about is, is an unfaithfulness to God, not an unfaithfulness to a person. And he goes on, do you think the scripture have no meaning? They say that God is what? Passionate that the spirit he has placed within us should be what? Faithful to him. And he gives. Somebody say he gives. What? Grace. How? How does God give grace? How does God give grace? As the scriptures say, God does what? Opposes the proud, but what? Gives grace to the humble. Verse 7, look at what it says. So what? Humble yourself. How? Then what do you do next? The grace to overcome the temptation is found in my willingness to humble myself to what God says. And that gives me the power to overcome. Stop arguing with God. Rather, humble yourself so that grace can be released so that you can overcome. Jesus warned and tried to prepare the disciples. He did two things for them that he also does for us. And I'll close with this. Jesus did two things. Here's the first one. He offered them hope. Look at Mark 14, verse 28. Are you still there? Look at this. Put it on the screen. Watch this. But after I am what? Raised from the dead, I will do what? Go ahead of you to where? And what? Hello. He makes a resurrection statement almost nonchalant and even telling them, hey, guess what? We're going to meet at this place. I'm making an appointment. They're going to kill me, but don't worry about that. I'm going to come back from the dead. I mean, wouldn't you have freaked out when Jesus said that? But they are so engrossed in their own belief system that they cannot hear what God is saying. They so focus on defending their desertion that they totally miss out on what Jesus is telling them. Sometimes we use more effort in defending our opinions than actually believing the word that Jesus speaks. He offers them hope. By painting a picture of the future, he gives them the answer, but, not, but they only hear the challenge. Sometimes we protest so much that we don't hear all what God is saying to us. He gives them hope. Secondly, are you still there? Yeah. He offers them a way through. Look at verse 39 of Luke 22, then accompanied by the disciples, Jesus left the upstairs room and went as usual to the Mount of Olives. There he what? There he what? Told them to do what? Pray. Why? I mean, this, it cannot be any more clearer than this. He tells them this is how you get through it. He tells them, boys, if you're going to make it, you guys are telling me that you won't quit on me. You guys are telling me that you won't run. You will not desert me. So guess what? Here's how you do it. This is how you're going to be able to withstand the test that is about to be placed before you. How do you withstand the test? You need to pray. Now, I want you to see something. Jesus does not offer them a way out, but he offered them a way through. There are things in your life that doesn't make any sense, but Jesus offers you hope. Why? Because he reminds you that your future is secure in him. He remind, you see, that's why he wants us to disconnect from an understanding that the only thing that matters is me staying alive. Ah, 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 staying alive, staying alive. 
that I, I, as long as I stay alive, listen, if you stay alive without purpose, you might as well be dead. The worst thing that can happen to you is not to die. Let me tell you what's the worst thing that can happen to you. The worst thing that can happen to you is to live a life without purpose and to die without Christ. Because if you die, if you live without purpose, life has no meaning. And if you die without Christ, your eternity is finished. You must remember that the most important thing that you possess is the soul that God has given you. And you are the one that determines how that soul will be managed on this side of eternity. So God comes through His grace. He forgives you. He releases you. But you are still the possessor of your soul. And you must still determine. Let me tell you something. All other things does not matter in the scale of eternity. What matters is knowing God, serving God, honoring God, pursuing God, and pursuing the purpose of God has laid out for you. And when you pursue that purpose and when you understand that I am the possessor of the soul that God has given me, and is there anything more valuable to me than my soul? And the answer is absolutely not. Because my soul not only lives now, my soul lives on for eternity. And if I die with Christ, I gain all that He has promised. We must be fully prepared for what's ahead and stop trying to run from it. Jesus doesn't make us sissy Christians who are so scared. I mean, we get a flat tire and now the tribulation has come. We don't get our check in time and oh my goodness sakes alive. You don't realize the pressure you've put on me. Some of you need to be re-educated and what it means to be a Christ follower and what it means to suffer for his sake and what it means to go through some stuff and get a little bit of commitment and get a little bit of backbone on the inside of you and stop being afraid of your own shadow and afraid of what the world says and afraid of what well, we're going to do. That you, what can you do to a man that's already dead? Am I communicating to anybody? You see, the Father knows exactly where you're at this morning. And no matter how much you say, I understand. Yes, I know. Yes, I, yes, I, I get it. It's like a husband telling a wife. She's been trying to tell the sucker, we need help. Uh, yes, I know. Yes, I know. But he ain't doing squat about it. It's because he doesn't know. Because he's more interested in just having peace tranquility, not true peace, tranquility without dissension that he would do everything to keep the dysfunction. Instead of going through the ugliness of exposing who I really am and exposing my vulnerability and being transparent and says, this is who I am. It's ugly. U-G-L-Y. I don't have no alibi. It's ugly. But guess what? I'm bringing that before God and I'm saying only you can heal this heart. Only you can make me love my wife the way I ought to love her. Only you can restore me. Only you can love me. Only you can give me the strength that I need to overcome that person person that I know I need to overcome and that stuff that I know I need to get rid of. God, take my ugly and make it beautiful. But if you're not truthful, you'll never get there. If you're not transparent, there's no power. Why? Because your arrogance is causing you to deal with turmoil because there's no grace in the place where arrogance resides. Ask God this morning, reveal to me, where in my life have I been arguing instead of submitting? And be willing to ask for help, for your father's help. Ask the Lord to make you aware of an assignment that the enemy has. Yes, what you've got to understand. Sweet cheeks, let me just tell you. <laughs> With your baby blue eyes, of your greenies. I, I, just, I just want you to know whether you have beautiful pearly whites or gums. It doesn't matter. I, I need you to get this. I, I need you to grasp this. The enemy hates you. 
whether you saved or unsaved, he just simply hates you. Why? Because you were created in the image of God, and he hates everything in God's image, and he will do everything he can to destroy. So guess what? He'll feed you with the drugs. He'll feed you with the immorality. He'll feed you with the sexual perversion. Why? Because he wants to distort who God wants you to be, because he's okay with you being trapped in a cycle of despondency and be confused about who you are. He's okay. He will help you defend that. He will help you stand up for it. He will tell everybody else that they hate us when they tell you it is wrong. Why? Because he wants to keep you trapped and he wants you to die in that depravity instead of finding out where grace is and power is so that you can be the person who you were created to be, not who you think you were created to be, but who he truly has created you to be. There is a freedom and a liberty because there's power in Christ Jesus. You must see the forest from the trees. And you must see your own arrogance before you will submit to his grace. Release the need always to be right. When somebody comes and speaks to you, stop saying, yeah, but. Yeah, you just don't understand. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I just don't understand why you love your dysfunction. You're right. I just don't understand why you just want to keep on being miserable. Yep, you're right. I just don't understand why you think you're more smarter than God. Yep, you're right. I don't understand that. You're right. I don't understand. But you know who I know who understands? It's Christ Jesus. And you know who I know that you can't lie to, even though you try? It's Christ Jesus. He knows you. No, no, no. No, no. He doesn't know the you you show others. He knows you. But he still loves you. And he's saying, come. All who are weary. And heavy laden, come, and I'll give you rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Come and learn from me. Are you willing to learn? The garden is coming. The test is coming. Are you prepared? Let's bow our heads this morning. Lord, I know this sounds harsh and hard, and maybe your people think I don't like them. But you know how much I love every soul that calls this the church. You know how we cry over them as staff. You know how we pray for them. You know how we believe for them, how we trust you for them. So today I bring all of us before you, and I ask, help us to be transparent and vulnerable. Help us not to have a facade of holiness but no reality. Forgive us where we need to be forgiven. Strengthen us where we need strength. Reveal where we need revelation. While every head is bowed and every eye closed in this room, online, inside this building, outside in the cafe, I'm just going to ask you today, if your eternity is not secure in Christ Jesus, what are you waiting for? Heaven and hell is real. It's not a figmentation of somebody's imagination. Why, how do I know this? Because Jesus taught more about hell than anybody else. So today, you have a decision to make. God invites you in and he says he'll change you, but you've got to be willing to be changed. If that's you, if you're in this room, I want to pray for you. If you're online, I want to pray for you. If you're sitting outside, I want to pray for you. Um, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to clap my hands together. If that's you, if you say, Henny, that's me, please pray for me today, then I'll pray for you today. Are you ready to go God's way instead of your way? Are you ready to confess Christ to make him the Lord of your life, the Savior of your life? Then this is how you start. Are you ready? Are you ready to do it God's way? One, two, 
Three, just pop your hand up and let me see it right now. Thank you, 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 back there, thank you, thank you, thank you, back there, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, back there, thank you, I see that, thank you, young man, thank you, God bless you, God bless you, thank you, thank you, so I see that over there, thank you, thank you, God bless you, you can put it down, thank you, you can put it down, thank you. You can put it down. Thank you. I see that online. Just use the hand raise emoji and say, it's me. Pray for me outside in the cafe. If that's you, just pop your hand up. Somebody will acknowledge it. Just do it now. Thank you. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. This is not an abracadabra prayer. It's just a way of bringing our hearts before the Lord. And I'm going to ask everybody to pray with me. If you're online, pray this out loud. Wherever you might be, just pray this inside here. Pray this outside. Pray this. Say this. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you today for your love, your mercy, your grace. I ask now that you would forgive me, that you'd give me a fresh start, that from today I will follow you and all the days of my life I will learn what it means to be a follower of Christ. Give me a brand new heart. Save me from my sin. Save me from my depravity. I confess Jesus Christ as my Lord and my Savior. I believe you were raised from the dead and you are alive. Come now and live in me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. If you believe that, give the Lord a clap offering that He is worthy of today. Come on, church.